So we'll begin. Om Ajnana Tamarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Panchakaupa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhaihevacha Patitanam Pavan Hedyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasade Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Okay. So welcome everyone to our ongoing study of the Bhagavad Gita, Unit 1, Bhakti Shastri, and we're on Chapter 9. We already began Chapter 9. Again, you can see the outline. Right? Krishna begins with his praise of pure devotion. How did he praise it? Who knows? Do you remember? Priya Satyabhama, do you remember? Rukmini. Hare Krishna Maharaj, beg forgiveness Maharaj got late. Yes, okay, no problem. Please, please have my respectful obeisances Maharaj. Yes, my obeisances to you. I'm asking a question, can you answer? I want to know how did Krishna praise pure bhakti? Praise pure bhakti. In the first three verses, who remembers? Yes. Uh, Maharaj, uh, it is most confidential and uh, he, uh, Krishna told Arjuna that uh, once you know this knowledge, nothing else remains to be known. Jnanam Vijnanam Sahitam. Okay, anything else? And uh, one needs to know this knowledge, uh, like one who doesn't have faith cannot uh, cross this uh, material world, like cannot cross this cycle of birth and death. So one needs to have faith. Well, you're only relating the second verse. Yeah, the, the, okay, the third, what you're saying, faith? Yes. That, yes, faith. Faith is in the, in the third verse. In the third verse. And what does the first verse speak about? Verse number one. Verse number one was regarding the Gyan and Vigyan, that this has both uh, uh, like knowledge and this is also the science. But there was something else. Arjuna's particular qualification. Yes, Maharaj. Arjuna said that uh, Krishna said that Arjuna is non envious. This is the most important right. uh, quality. Yes. yes. Right. Thank you. Non envious. Right. Pure bhakti, pure devotion means no envy of others. And Arjuna is not envious, and that's why Arjuna is hearing Bhagavad Gita. All right, then we spoke about Krishna's inconceivable relationship with this world. What's so inconceivable about Krishna's relationship with this world? Oh, I, I can't understand what you're saying, Mariji. Something wrong with your mic. Am I audible now? Not very good. Not very clear. Can you try again? Yes, Maharaj. Is it better now? Hare Krishna? Hare Krishna? It's somewhat echo. There's still echo there. It's not very nice. I'm trying to you. Someone can tell me Krishna's inconceivable relationship with the world? 
yes but, maharaj that is krishna's uh, uh, actually this is krishna's opul uh, how to explain krishna uh, separated energy krishna doesn't uh, interact uh, uh, interact with the material energy directly uh, just like by just uh, by his glance uh, he there was like example of flower uh, like as we go passes through with a uh, 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 garden and uh, uh, flower blossoms comes uh, but uh, we don't we don't need to even touch the flowers but the uh, uh, fragrance comes so similarly krishna is, uh, is not uh, krishna energy is also like this maharaj yes. just by his glance yes right good krishna's over by will. his by his will 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 yes by his will by his inconce by his yogam aishwarya by his mystic potency right yes, yes. yogam aishwarya yes. that he is able to maintain and and oversee everything all the affairs of this world although he does yes. does not involve them does not involve himself directly with it and we gave different examples right how did we show the how did we compare the neutrality of krishna in the how did what's the example given to show krishna's neutrality in dealing with people in the material world some people are suffering yes. and some are being yes rewarded. yes maharaj example of the judge maharaj judge gives it somebody just just judge is just sitting at the seat and he says it's a, he gives a punishment to one to go to jail he gave punishment to sub, to the hang to the neck and and some and to someone he awarded the wealth so like this and he is a one so nobody can say judge that uh, you are uh, giving uh, punishment to me and, and to another you are giving the wealth so uh, the judge will say that that that, that you have done the wrong thing so you are getting punishment but another person has met with in some accident and as a compensation he is getting uh, 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 the wealth or the uh, recompensation like so uh, this is the thing the same lies with krishna krishna is uh, uh, like neutral in this way krishna is neutral whatever we are getting in this material world is is a, is a uh, is is our deed which we have done in the past lives so we are suffering or gaining whatever position we are in so it must be a lot of hard work for krishna isn't it that he is doing so many things maintaining all these universities must be a lot of hard work for him <laughs> not at all maharaj krishna has appointed so many demigods and uh, uh, he he doesn't need to do anything actually he is he just perform his past times he is busy doing this and other people do does everything as for him how does he do everything uh, uh, as a incarnation uh, like uh, 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 pradyumn anirudh sankarshan and uh, vishnu so uh, other than like uh, garbhadak shai vishnu shiva dakshai vishnu like this they everybody has their own role Pr- brahma 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 created the universe uh, uh, lord vishnu maintains it and shiva at the end annihilated this uh, like this maharaj what's krishna doing Krishna is busy doing pa- in his past times. He doesn't need to do anything, but he's uh, like uh, he's like that. As you give the example of uh, uh, his his uh, his grace Amri, uh, Amrish um, uh, Amrish uh, Amrish Prabhu. Amri- so, Amrish Maharaj. Amrish Maharaj. Amrish Maharaj. Amrish Maharaj. Yes, he is also uh, he he. is all his limbs are busy in serving the supreme personality of lord ed even his wealth everything mansa vacha karmana everything all the senses is busy but uh, he uh, like this maharaj yes with 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 said maharaj ambarish is indifferent to what's going on in the state but he's there he's on the throne and he lets the ministers all do all the government 
all the decisions in running a country, it's all done by the, the ministers who are there. But Anbarish Maharaj, he's busy chanting and hearing the glories of the Lord. He's busy reading the books and all the, worshipping the deities. And he lets all the ministers do all the governing. So Krishna is like that. He's enjoying with his devotees in the spiritual world. Okay, and then a bit further on, we heard about how fools neglect bhakti, the divine don't. Who could expand on this? Do you know text number 11? Yes, Maharaj, like the fools, fools, they are ignorant. That is why they don't understand that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They think that he is, a, he is someone who is a, a mystic person or very uh, uh, powerful. But they are not able to understand. So, the, like different reasons for that, some are envious or some, some uh, they have poor fund of knowledge. That is why they are not able to understand the supremacy of God. Yes, they think of Krishna like a human being, right? They don't understand his divine position and supremacy over all that be. So what what is the re, what is the result of that ignorance? Ma Maharaj, those who are devotees, they don't they are they don't go to uh, uh, Golok Vrindavan. Those who are jnani, they will also not get their destination. Uh, and uh, uh, jnani like they will not get liberation and karmi, they will also uh, not get fruitive result. Yes, right. The karmis won't get to heaven. The jnanis won't get moksha. And if the devotees don't properly understand Krishna, they also won't get back to Godhead, right? Okay, so the fools neglect bhakti, but the, the, the divine don't. What do the divine do? Who are these divine? They are Mahatmas. Why? Because they are always engaged in the in uh, discharging loving devotional service under the lotus feet of uh, uh, Radha and Krishna. Mm -hmm. What are they doing? What kind of devotional service? They have determination uh, yeah. and they have perseverance. That's their qualities. Yeah, I want to know their activities. They are chanting glories of Krishna and going, uh, yes. going down before them. Yes, always chanting the holy name and bowing down before me. These yeah. great souls yeah. perpetually worship me with devotion. Right? And then yes. the chapter goes on to speak about indirect worship of Krishna. We have to cover that tonight. And then we will hear also the glories of devotional service, the last part, part of the chapter describes the glories of bhakti yoga all right so we're going to speak now about this uh, other people these uh, in who, who worship krishna indirectly text number 15 speaks about devotees who are inferior to the previously mentioned ones who was previously mentioned just Mahatmas. Be, yes, the Mahatmas, right? So they're not Mahatmas. These, they're devotees, but they're inferior to the Mahatmas, to the great souls who are always engaged in chanting and worshipping Krishna and like that. So they're, they're devotees, but they're inferior devotees. Devotees who, as described here, who have a predominance of Gyan, but with Bhakti as secondary action. So you could see like mm, bhakti mishra jnanis, <laughs> right? Mixed devotion. Their devotion is mixed with jnan, not pure devotees. And one group are described, verses number 16, 17, 18 and 19, where Lord Krishna describes those people who worship the Vishwarup, meaning what? The universal form, right? People worship the universal form. This is also mentioned actually in Srimad Bhagavatam. You would see when you study Srimad Bhagavatam, those of you who have read Srimad Bhagavatam, you know in the second canto, 
Sukadeva Goswami begins his description of the worship of the Lord by worshipping the universal form. Because there are people, they're not Mahatmas, but they're, they're devotees and they worship the Lord through the universe. They see God in the universe, right? How will, what, what, what are some different aspects of the Vishwarup? Can somebody tell me? What are some different aspects of the Vishwarup? You know some of the different limbs of the body of the Lord, how they're described? Maharaj, like uh, Brahmanas are called as the head of the Vishwarup, uh, right. arms are the Kshatriyas, Mm -hmm. Vesha the belly and uh, like legs are the Shudras. Yes, right. Yes, good. The different Varnas are all there in the Vishwarup. Yes. Anything else? And uh, like I, uh, Surya is the eye, like the uh, sun is the eye of Lord. Yes, yes, good. The eye, the sun, of, sun is like the eye of the Lord. Uh-huh. And the rivers, what about the rivers? They're like what? Rivers? Perspiration of perspiration. I don't remember exactly. I think perspiration the, of the Lord. The rivers are like veins on the body of the Lord. Like okay. the and, uh, veins. I th and I think the hair, hair on the body are like trees. Yes, right. The trees or different vegetation, plants. They're, they're all like hair on the body of the Lord. Yes. Good. And the upper planets, where were where, where are the upper planets in the in the universal form? The upper planets will be like the head of the Lord, and the lower planets are like the feet or the sole of the Vishwarup. All right. So in this way, everything is there. So people worship the Vishwarup, and then. Demigod worship is also included there. Then people worship the different dem demigods. And indirectly, they're worshipping Krishna. They're worshipping demigods, but it's indirectly worshipping Krishna. So we're going to hear about these different worshippers, beginning with this, well, this is the summary verse. This verse describes the different kinds of worshippers, right? Somebody read. Mukham. <laughs> Others who engage in sacrifice by the cultivation of knowledge worship the Supreme Lord as the one without the second. As divers and many, as divers and many and in the universal form. Thank you, Maharaj. Right? So we have the Prabhupada's lecture from this. Anye, actually. Anye. Anye meaning others. Others. Who are these others? So they're mentioned here. You can see the others. One, two, three. And there are three different others who are all worshipping the Lord, but worshipping Him indirectly. And now the first kind mentioned is the one which is most prominent among these uh, indirect worshippers. And... <laughs> It's the most prominent, it's also the, the lowest, <laughs> it's the worst one, right? So they are called mon ekatvena. Ekatvena meaning monis. They wor he worships himself as one with the Lord. It's the lowest, you know, it's the lowest and it's, it's the most predominant, non-different between worshipper and object of worship. Yeah, it's really bad to think there's no difference between the worshipper and the object of worship. So with you, you may be worshipping the deity and you think there's no difference between Krishna and me. 
I'm worshipping Krishna, but I'm also Krishna. <laughs> so that's monism, that's this ekat vena, thinking ourself to be one with the Lord. And it's so common, this philosophy of impersonalism or monism is everywhere, is spread everywhere. So Lord Chaitanya was very eager to defeat it. And particularly the followers of Madhva Acharya, they preached very strongly against this uh, monist philosophy. All right, and then you have the second kind of others. It's called Pritakvena Bahuda, Vibhuti Upasana. Means that they concoct some form of the Supreme Lord. And it includes also demigod worship. So demigod worship is also included in this Pritakvena Bahuda. We just imagine some form of the Lord. And then number three, Vishvatomukam, is actually the best one. And this is worshipping the universal form. Described in verses 16 up to 19. All right, so here's the description of Ekat Vena. Someone can read for us. Aham Ahan Grahopsana Na Devo Devam Acharit. Without being on the level of a Deva, example pure, one cannot worship the Lord. Na Devo Devam Acharit. Archayit. One who has not risen to the level of a Deva cannot chant this mantra. According to this direction of the Shastra, one must think himself qualitatively non-different from the Supreme. The Narayan Kavach Shield. Summary. Mm -hmm. All right. So, sometimes you will come across this philosophy called Ahangrahopasana, where we identify ourselves on being one with the Supreme. So this is Ekatvena, this is the impersonalist philosophy. Hmm. And we see it mentioned there also from Narayana Kavacha, which is described in Srimad Bhagavatam in the sixth canto, that we should you have to think yourself one with the Supreme. Then only you can chant the mantra. All right, someone read, please. Indirect worshippers of Krishna. Text 15. Anne, others. Now who, those who are directly worshipping the Supreme Lord, personality of Godhead, Shri Krishna, they have been described as Mahatma. And there are others, worshippers, they cannot conceive of the Supreme Personality of Godhead directly on account of being less advanced. Therefore, they have been described here, Anne, others. So, others, they worship the Absolute Truth in three different ways. The first class others, amongst the others, there is the first class, second class, third class. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaji. Right? So, first class, the first class are those who worship the universal form. And the third class, those are the monists who think themselves to be one with the Supreme. Prabhupada explains more. All right, please read. Ahangraho Pasana. So amongst the persons who worship the Absolute Truth, not directly as the Personality of Godhead, but as Ahangraho Pasanam. Ahangraho Pasanam means taking himself as the Supreme. This we have already explained, that taking himself as the Supreme means as the part and parcel of the Supreme. If we study myself, then I can understand also what is God. The only difference is quantitatively. God is great and I am small. Otherwise, so far, quality is concerned, that is one. So this ahango, ahangraho pasanam, that is number one. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> oh. It, it's very small. Are you able to read it, Manaji? Yes, Maharaj. The next Upasana, 
नेक्स्ट वर्शिप इज एक पृथक ट्वेन भगवदगीता नाइन पॉइंट फिफ्टीन पृथक ट्वेन मीन्स पेंथीज्म जस्ट लाइक देयर आर पर्सन हू आर वर्शिप हु वर्शिप एनी डेमी गॉड एज गॉड देयर ओपिनियन इज दैट देयर आर डिफरेंट फॉर्म्स ऑफ गॉड सो एनी फॉर्म वी एक्सेप्ट एज गॉड एंड वर्शिप वी शेल बी बेनिफिटेड वी शेल अप्रोच द हाइस्ट परफेक्शन दैट इज एनदर सेक्शन सो दिस कैन बी एडजस्टेड दैट गॉड इज एवरीवेयर दैट देर इज नो डिनाइंग दिस फैक्ट बिकॉज बाय हिज एनर्जी ही इज एवरीवेयर जस्ट लाइक वी आर हिज एनर्जी लिविंग एंटिटीज दे आर सुपीरियर एनर्जीज ऑफ गॉड अपरियम इतस्तु विधि में प्रकृतिम परम पराम पराम मीन सुपीरियम सुपीरियर सो वी आर ऑल्सो एनर्जी सो एनर्जी एंड द एनर्जेटिक दे आर वन जस्ट लाइक द सन एंड द सनशाइन दे आर नॉट डिफरेंट सो वेयर एवर द सनशाइन इज देयर देर इज सन यू कैन नॉट डिनाई दैट वेयर एवर द सनशाइन इज देयर देर इज सन सिमिलरली वेयर एवर द एनर्जी ऑफ गॉड इज देयर देर इज गॉड सो इन दैट वे एवरीथिंग इज गॉड पृथक ट्वेन एवरीथिंग पेंथीज्म दीज आर डिफरेंट प्रोसेसेस बट these processes one has to transcend just like simply studying the sunshine is not complete study of the sun although sunshine is not different from the sun still you simply study scientifically scientifically what is the molecules what are these rays where this brilliant illuminative came so many things you can go on studying that is also one sense studying the sun but not sun also Should I continue from yeah, Maharaj? Yes, yeah, it's con- it's connected. Ji, Vishwa Roop Upasana. So Prithak Twain and Vishwato Mukham. Vishwato Mukham means the universal form. Just like it is stated in the shastras, the hills. Oh, they are bones of God. The trees and grass, and I mean to say vegetation, vegetation. They are just like hairs on the body of the Lord. So the ocean, the navel of God, is the navel of God. in this way there are description the highest planet swarga brahmalok or oh that is the head of god the lowest planet patal lok that is i mean to say the soul of god the these things are described the whole universal form so somebody prefers the universal form somebody prefers that all everything whatever we see it is god and somebody prefers that i am god so these are different methods of appreciating god but they are also accepted because they have taken into the line they are better than who are just like animals simply eating sleeping and defending and mating but those who have taken either of these gyan ya gain prithak twain and vishwato mukham so those who are impersonalist they prefer these three processes and those who are personalist they prefer directly to worship the supreme personality of godhead shri krishna so they are all transcendentalist they are on the line but here in bhagavad gita those who are directly worshiping the supreme lord they have been described as mahatma and those who are worshiping in other processes they have been described anne anne means others so they have not been given so much importance although they have been accepted they have been because they have come to the line mm-hmm. okay thank you very much marriji right so this was prabhupada's lecture on this topic which is uh quite nice for us to understand we should appreciate these different the, the three different kinds of indirect methods of worshiping the lord right so text 11 and 12 was describing the impersonalists and then text 14 and 15 was oh text 13 and 14 was describing the mahatmas then we came to 15 and you've got this anye you're hearing about the others uh, those who are worshiping the lord indirectly and begins first of all with uh the worship of the lord by his uh text 16 to 19 is describing that's describing the impersonal feature in personal worship of the lord and that you could call it what the ahangra ho pasana oh 
No, this is a, it's called the Vishwarup. This is the Vishwarup. 16 to 19 this is the Vishwarup. So, you can see in text 16, Krishna says, it, it's a bit like the vibhutis almost. He it, said, it is uh, Krishna saying, it is I who am the ritual. I, the sacrifice, the offering to the ancestors, the healing herb, the transcendental chant. I am the butter and the fire and the offering. And then in text 17, he says, uh, he said, I am the father of these, this universe, the mother, the support and the grandsire. I am the object of knowledge, the purifier and the syllable Om. I am also the Rig, the Sama, and the Yajur Veda. And then text 18, it, we'll see, just see what he says here. Text 18, he says, I am the goal, the sustainer, the master, the witness, the abode, the refuge, and the most dear friend. I am the creation and the annihilation, the basis of everything, the resting place, and the eternal soul. <laughs> and then text 19 again continues, I give heat and I withhold and send forth the rain. I am immortality, I am also death personified. Both spirit and matter are in me. So in this way, this is Krishna describing the worship of the universal form. seeing Krishna's uh, identifying everything with, him, with himself. And then he goes on, uh, text 20, to describe about uh, how people worship, how people can go to higher planets by wor worshipping different demigods. Text 20 describes this, those who study the Vedas and drink the Soma juice, seeking the heavenly planets, worship me indirectly. Purified of sinful reactions, they take birth on the pious heavenly planet of Indra, where they enjoy godly delights. So anything wrong with that? No, Maharaj. No, you're happy, eh? You want that? You want to go to heaven no. and enjoy heavenly delights? No, Maharaj, but this is what Krishna is saying, this is all right. So I'm happy that Krishna is saying I'm this, I'm that. So I'm happy. No, but this is something different. Right? That was finished with. That was worship of the universal form. But then after the talking about the universal form, then he says these other things. And these talks. are like karam kandis, right? These are like karam kandis that those who study Vedas and drink somras and seeking heavenly planets that they want some pious outcomes uh, from their worship. Yes, right. They want to enjoy the material world, right? They're karmis, they're fruit of workers. You could say karma mimamsas. <laughs> Text tw 21 goes on. And when they have enjoyed, when they have enjoyed, again they're enjoying vast heavenly sense pleasure and the results of their pious activities are exhausted they return to this material mortal planet again thus those who seek sense enjoyment by adhering to the principles of the three vedas achieve only repeated birth and death so that's the result of uh, this indirect process, they're not getting out, they're not solving the real problem, they're still in the material world. So 20 and 21 were describing like that about the Karmakandi materialist, how he's enjoying, trying to enjoy the material world. And then text 22, Krishna describes about the devotee. And you can see the verse here, text 22, it's a, 
an important verse, an, uh, de uh, describing again Ananya Bhakti, right? Un unflinching, steady devotional service. Someone can read text 22. But those who always worship me with exclusive devotion, meditating upon my transcendental form, to them I carry with what they lack and I preserve what they have. Yes, you know this verse quite well, I can see. You're quite familiar with this verse. We're, we like this verse, you know, we like the idea. Krishna said, he maintains his devotee, right? We like the idea where Krishna says, I preserve what they have, I carry what they like. But who does he do that for? He, he only does that for his very pure yeah, devotees. Okay. His very pure devotees who always worship me with exclusive devotion, meditating on my transcendental form. So you, we have to be qualified. We want to get this reciprocation from Lord Krishna. It's demanding, it's demanding. A, Krishna wants exclusive, pure devotion, not mixed devotion. It has to be very pure. So that means we have to get rid of all the anathas, the dirty things in the heart. So Krishna promises he will maintain his devotees. This is one of the important verses. Yes, someone read? Yoga Shemam Mahanayam Ahamayam Bhavati Shamayam Well, Mr. Materialist, you have to work very hard, but here the assurance from the Lord is that those who are unflinching and totally devoted to the transcendental service of me, in return I take responsibility for their care and comfort. Now this shloka is very important for the devotees. There was a great devotee, his name was Arjuna, Char Arjuna, Char Arjuna Charya, SP tells the story Lecture BG 9.20-22, New York 66. Do you know the story, Maharaji? Do you know the story of Arjunacharya? No, I don't know the story, Maharaji, but I want to just share with you that this verse is important uh, even in the corporate world because um, this is linked to the lead. I'm sorry, I'm just digressing, but I wanted to share with you that this is also the leadership quality, right? Where he carries what his devotees lack and he preserves what they have. So we say that good leaders, they actually uh, work from their team strengths and then work on their improvement areas. So we hear this a lot in the corporate world also. I, I don't know the story, but I wanted to just mention this. So that's why we hear this verse quite a lot and it's very close to most of the people's hearts. Uh, they actually quote the verse, they actually use this, Yoga Shema Bahamiya. They do, they do in some of the leadership talks, uh, you know, not so much in the UK, but then in wherever we can relate to Gita, this shlok comes quite a lot. And it is also in Vishnu Sahasnam, I read it quite a lot, you know, after we finish the Sahasnam, then this, this verse comes there also. But I've heard a lot in leadership, so we use this in the leadership lectures and uh, leadership talks. Okay, interesting to hear, yeah. <laughs> Who would like to tell us a story about Arjunacharya? Who knows the story? One of our Prabhus must know. Arjunacharya, right? What happened? Who was he? Somebody? No volunteers? Okay, Arjuna Charya was a humble Brahmana, a great devotee, as we'll hear. Humble Brahmana, he lived by begging. So he was reading Bhagavad Gita and when he came to this verse, Yoga Kshema Vahamiyaham, he, he didn't think it's possible. He thought it should be yoga kshema karomiyaham. 
yoga shema karome aham, and not, not that Krishna will directly do it, not that Krishna personally will come and do it, but he will arrange somebody else to do it. And so he crossed out vahami aham, vahami, and or he crossed out one of the words, and he was changing it. And then he went out to do his begging. And when he went, went out to do his begging, he hadn't been gone very long, when a knock came to the door, and there were two boys, two young boys, very good looking, one blackish colour and one whitish colour, and they were carrying big baskets of food, different provisions. And they said, quick, quick, take these things, take these things. We, we want to go, we don't want to meet your husband again. And, and the lady in the house, the husband of, our, the wife of Arjuna Acharya, she was surprised that, why, why, what's wrong? What, you know, what is all these things? Where did you get all of this? And they said, no, we have, we, we're bringing this, this is, your husband told us to bring all these things. You, you need all these things for your home. But we don't want to meet your husband again. And they said, he beat us. And they showed marks on their body, marks like they had been beaten with a cane. And the, the lady, the wife of Arjuna Shari was shocked because she knew her husband to be a mild natured, gentle Brahmana, and who, who would never strike children. <laughs> especially children like these two young boys who had come to her door. So the two boys left and then the, then the husband came home and the husband came home, he was complaining, I couldn't collect anything. He had gone for begging and nobody had given anything. But then the wife said, no, the two boys came and they said, you sent them with all of these things. And the husband was shocked, what? I said, I never sent any boys, and, he, and she described them. And then he, could, he, was un, he was puzzled that one is black and one is white, and they're very, very attractive. And then she told them that, why did you, she said to her husband, why did you beat them? I saw the marks on their body where you came them. Why did you do that to these? And, and the husband was shocked that he said, I never came to anybody, I didn't beat anyone. And then he went to look at his Bhagavad Gita and he saw that in his Bhagavad Gita he had crossed out Vahami Aham. And so he, un he understood that Lord Krishna had personally come there to show him that it was actually true that the Brahmana was thinking Krishna won't personally do it, Krishna may send somebody else to do it, but Krishna came himself. He wanted Arjuna Acharya to know that it was actually a fact that Krishna would personally come and take care and maintain his devotees and carry whatever they have, maintain what they have and carry what they lack. So that is the special mercy of Krishna for those who are fully devoted to Krishna and always meditate on Krishna. So we want to ask you, take a partner. How many people are here tonight? 18 Maharaj. 18, all right, so nine pairs. And we want you to exchange experiences where Krishna carried what you lacked or preserved what you had, and discuss why it is not a burden for Krishna to maintain his devotees. All right? You must have had some experiences where Krishna carried what you lacked or preserved what you had. We hope so. so Maharaj, is it from our life or from, like we have to give examples from scriptures? Well, best is from your own life. But if you don't have any exam any from your own personal life, it may be somebody you know, or it may be from the scriptures. But we were looking for examples from your own life, that's ideal. If you really don't have anything from your own life, 
then let us hear from the life of others. But give some examples. Yes? So go in the group, go into your pairs, and we'll give you time, wait for you to come back. Shouldn't take long. Uh, I've opened all rooms, Maharaj. Devotees, please accept the request that you Okay, call. thank you. Thank you, Maharaji.
All right. Mary Jane? Yes? Yes, sir. Yes, I think we can close the rooms now, Mary Jane. Get people back. Okay, Mary Quite a few devotees didn't join Maharaj, so I clubbed them into groups of three. Okay. So we had uh, nine participants who did the activity. Okay, good. Yes? Is everyone back? Oh, no. Not yet, Maharaj. Now everybody's back, Maharaj. Okay. So, I hope you have a, I hope you had a fruitful discussion. I hope you have some experiences to share with us. Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, yes we did. May I say something Maharaj? Yeah, please do. Yeah. We discussed Maharaj and from our own personal experiences we shared and came to, we had some doubt and query. Like for example, uh, we all considered ourselves uh, on the very basic level sadhakas. Yeah. Not, yeah. Even pure devo uh, not even devotees, what to say of pure or middle devotees. But we see from our own life experiences that Krishna does maintain and protect us and provide everything we need for our spiritual advancement and practices. And at the same time, we have heard that uh, for the pure, from the pure devotees, uh, for the higher advanced devotees, Krishna rather takes away everything. And that is his mercy, that he takes away everything. So, it like, uh, uh, seems like contradiction. Can you please clarify? <laughs> Well, it's not that Krishna has to take away from the devotees, but the devotees are not, they're not attached to everything. They, they're willing, they give it for Krishna's service. Hmm? Prabhupada gave everything for, for the service of Krishna. It's not that Krishna has to, has to take it away. Hmm. So, Krishna may take some things away, somebody is attached to something, but it's not a rule that Krishna takes away things from people who are advanced. That's not a rule. If Krishna does take something away, it's for our benefit, it's for our purification. But generally, it's the devotees themselves, they will give up everything for the service of Krishna. They will sacrifice whatever they have. And there, there are many examples of that. Now, I was thinking, Krishna carried what you liked. I, I, I was thinking, like when I go to countries, foreign countries, I go to foreign countries, sometimes, you know, going to countries, I'm preaching mostly in Asian countries, like I went to uh, Thailand, and, uh, you know, I didn't really know anybody there. I just went there, and I, I was just distributing books, but Krishna arranged, you know, I met people, people who were interested and people who actually were devotees. Krishna arranges, you know, puts people there and you, you meet them. But going to countries like that, you, you get, you actually get help. People come forward to take, to help you to do the things, just like when Prabhupada was in America, he got people to do so many things for him. And Prabhupada, Prabhupada had been writing and he, had, he wanted somebody to type and somebody just appeared and he knew everything about typesetting and typing and everything. And this, this was in 1960s, and, but the boy just appeared and he did all the typing, typed out all Prabhupada's lectures and then he just disappeared. They never saw him again. 
just amazing, you know, people just come, Krishna sends them. And Malati, she talks about how sometimes they had no money and somebody would just come with just the amount of money they needed to pay the bill. Yes, Maharaj, whatever you're saying, saying is in line with this shloka, Yoga Kshemam Vaham Meham. In case of Srila Prabhupada and you, pure devotees like you. But uh, we are nowhere in the case of pure devotees. We are not even middle devotees, Maharaj But it is true in our case also. That's why I'm saying it seems like um, uh, you just said uh, that he does it for pure devotees who have unflinching faith towards Krishna. But we do not have it. Still he is protecting us, protecting what we have and preserving and providing what we lack. So why do matlab, is this happening with us? Well, Krishna is encouraging you to give you more faith in devotional service. You can see it like that. It may not always be like that, but it's happening. Sometimes you, you, you feel, you could maybe in the initial stages we feel like that, and that's Krishna encouraging us to become more committed to Krishna consciousness. Right? Ji Maharaj, he is very merciful. He was taking care of us all. All right, anybody else like to comment on this? Krishna carried what you like, preserved what you had. We never hear from the men. I don't. Is there some men there who could comment on this? I'd like to hear from some males. All very quiet. We don't have any men in the class. <laughs> Okay, okay, Maharaj you wanted to speak, yeah? Maharaj, can I, can I say something? Okay, go ahead, yeah. I, I want to share Maharaj, my husband's experience here. He's in the class, but I don't know, maybe... Uh, so he used to travel a lot, Maharaj, before uh, joining the business with uh, in India. Okay, he was in a multinational company and once, uh, it was Ikadashi. And he was fasting, of course, and the whole day he could not find anything much to eat. So naturally, he was taking this water and he was not eating. And you know, suddenly he comes back to his hotel room where the company had put him to stay, and he finds a big basket of fruits. Mm -hmm. A big basket of fruits lying in the hotel room. So he, he, you know, he was really, he was really happy. He was, you know, he said, "I really thank Krishna that day." I could not get anything to eat, but he was the one who provided. Hmm. So that you know, I can at least eat something and go to bed. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. Krishna arranged. He did, Maharaj. A lot of times. So he was once, he was in Brazil and uh, he was just strolling around and he was, uh, he was thinking that he could have been in India and you know, I think it was uh, some festival. And he was missing out on it. And suddenly, you know, there, there's a big Sankirtan party walking on the beach and doing nice Harinam and everything. So that is, that also happened with him. Mm. <laughs> yeah, devotees are everywhere. We just have to be patient, find them. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, Maharaj, uh, I, I think that uh, in book distribution, this uh, this uh, phenomenon of Krishna helping comes out today, comes out very strongly. So, in small ways, of course, there have been many, many big instances in my life as well where Krishna really put it. But I want to share a very simple incident which uh, with my, which really found my faith in Krishna Prabhupada and Krishna, which was that I had this habit when I was in Delhi, I would distribute, I would carry books for my meetings and I would just distribute the... Uh, speak up, uh, speak up a bit. Your voice is very faint. Speak up. Can you, can you hear me, Maharaj, now? It's still faint. Hey, uh, is it, is it any better? That, yes, now better, yes. Okay. Maharaj, I was saying that uh, I have many instances, uh, but I just want to share a very small instance, but really, affect, really, really affirm my belief. 
I'm saying that in book distribution, I felt that this thing comes out to be true very strongly. I mean, I personally experienced Krishna helping a lot in book distribution. Uh, I was, when I was in, in Delhi, I used to have this habit of carrying some books in my bag when I would go for meetings. And uh, I had kept almost like a principle that I would uh, finish all the books that I've carried and I would distribute them before I go back home. There was one time uh, I had this one book left and it was almost 10 o'clock in the evening. I was, carried, I was coming back in a, in a rickshaw in, in India, in Delhi. And uh, in this e rickshaw next to me, there was this uh, drunkard sitting. And, and he was a very poor man. I mean, so poor that the topic would not have, one cannot imagine him to have money to eat. And he was drunk. And somehow I had this last book in my hand and my home was just, just uh, around the corner. And uh, having faith in Krishna, I just asked that person randomly if he would like to buy over I He was so drunk, he didn't even know what I was speaking. And uh, somehow he saw Gita and, and he felt so thankful and he just uh, looked into his pocket and whatever he had, he just gave it to me. And, uh, and this incident and I've had so many other incidents where the most unexpected situation uh, because I had this desire to distribute Gita, finish my stock before I go home, someone or the other would somewhere would come emerge and, and would buy these Gitas. Okay, thank you very much, Prabhu. Very nice. Certainly, when we go out there on book distribution, you can really experience Krishna taking, giving mercy, Krishna sending and helping us. Okay, why is it not a burden for Krishna to maintain his devotees? Who would like to answer? Maharaj Kenya. Yeah, go ahead, Maharaj um, Maharaj, I, w I also want to share that uh, uh, one of the example in my life. Maharaj, uh, I just got remembered when Mataji was saying that uh, the Prabhu was out. Maharaj, I also went uh, abroad and uh, 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 in 2005, I left uh, eating onion garlic. So uh, when, I, when I, I, I went there on cruise and I was so fortunate that at that time, they were making a, a world book of record. Uh, they were making a world book of record of Bhagavatam in 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 sea. So there was there was a Jain food without onion, garlic, without even uh, uh, tomatoes. So like so, I was so fortunate that uh, I got this everything there. And uh, uh, one more incident, Maharaj. Uh, uh, I met with an accident. So uh, it was so, so bad that uh, uh, I hurt so badly. I went, uh, when, 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 the, when uh, my family and other people took me to the hospital, uh, everybody was very afraid. But just after five days, when I went to doctor, I was walking at my own and I was recovered. So Lord, that doctor was also very much like uh, strained at how I recovered in just five days. And one more example, just sudden, that I was working in the material world and uh, I left my job uh, three years before. I, whenever I used, when I used to work, I didn't want it to work, uh, but uh, somehow I had to, so I was working. Um, my heart was never there. So uh, uh, whatever earnings I was getting in my job, still uh, somehow I'm getting here. So these are the uh, few examples in my life. And Maharaj, I, I this, this thing about Krishna, like discuss why it is not a burden for a Krishna to maintain his devotees like, because Krishna loves his devotees. Krishna yes. simply, Krishna simply loves his devotees. He knows nothing but his devotees and Krishna devotees know nothing but Krishna. So if we love somebody, so uh, we will uh, we will do anything and everything for that person. Right. Yes. And Maharaji, we also read in Nectar of Devotion that Krishna is purchased by his devotees. So he is like enslaved by his devotees. So you know he that's why uh, he would maintain his pure devotees. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay. We'll go ahead. Here's a quote. Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur commenting on this verse. 
922. Someone like to read? On the other hand, the happiness of my Ananya Bhaktas is given by me. It is not obtained by pious acts. They are at all times nityam, well versed in matters concerning me, abhi yukta nam, and are always ignorant of all other things. Or the phrase can mean that they constantly desire to be in my association. For such persons, I take care of their attainment of wealth, yoga, and their maintenance, shemam. Though they do not expect such things, it would be unsuitable for the Lord simply to say that he performs these acts. Thus the word Vahami, meaning carry, is used. The use of the word Mahami indicates that the Lord bears the burden of maintaining their bodies in the manner that the householder takes the responsibility for maintaining his own wife and children. Thus, one should not say that like others, their attainment or preservation of bodily needs is due to karma. Mm-hmm. Okay. Sometimes we think, you know, oh, he has good karma. No, it's Krishna's arrangement. Not just karma. It's done by Krishna. Krishna personally takes care of the devotees. All right, going ahead, text 20, 23. We're hearing more. Someone read the verse. Ye api ananya devata bhakta, yajante shraddhayan vitaha, te api maam eva konte ya yajanti avadhi purvakam. Those who are devotees of other gods and worship them with faith actually worship only me, O son of Kunti, but they do so in a wrong way. Thank you. Yes. So they're devotees of Ananya Devata Bhakta, they're the other gods, not the Supreme Lord Krishna. So worshipping the demigods, right? And they have faith in them, they're, but actually they're worshipping Krishna. But they do so in the wrong way, avidi purvakam, it's the wrong way. They're not really worshipping, it's not so pleasing to Krishna. Avidi Purvakam. They worship me without following the process, with the vidi by which I am attainable. We didn't follow. Prabhupada explains. Someone read? One has to follow the laws made by the government, not by officers or directors. Similarly, everyone is to offer his worship to the Supreme Lord only that will automatically satisfy the different officers and directors of the Lord. The officers and directors are engaged as representatives of the government and to offer some bribe to the officers and directors is illegal. This is stated here as avidhi purvakam. In other words, Krishna does not approve the unnecessary worship of the demigods. Worship of demigods may be accepted if people know that these demigods are authorized agents of the Supreme Lord. There is acceptance of Supreme Lord, but those fools who do not accept the Supreme God and misunderstand that this particular type of demigod is all in all, oh, they are doing nonsense. They are placing so many competitors of the Supreme Lord that this that is avidhi purvakam. This is, that is illegal. Nobody can be competitor of the Supreme Lord. The Supreme Lord is known as Asam Ur- Urdhava. Nobody is greater than the Supreme Lord and nobody is equal. It's from Bhagavad Gita 9.23-24, New York, December 10, 1966. Thank you very much, Master Ji. Very nice. Yes. So, is Prabhupada saying worship of demigods is wrong? Look at the top. No, what? no, no. No, right. The top, the top of the slide. Worship of demigods may be accepted. What is the condition? If people know that uh, uh, that these demigods are authorized agents of Supreme Lord, as we were discussing earlier also about the demigods. Right, yes. If we know they're all part of Krishna, agents of Krishna. 
So then there is acceptance of the Supreme Lord. But if we think the demigod is the Supreme, if we think they're all one, then it's wrong. So we have to understand properly. Yes, next verse, someone read. Yanti Deva Vrata Devan Petrin Yanti Petri Vrataha Bhutani Yanti Bhutejaya Yanti Ma Mad Yajinu Apimam. Those who worship the demigods will take birth among the demigods. Those who worship the ancestors go to the ancestors. Those who worship ghosts and spirit will take birth among such beings. And those who worship me will live with me. So how are you going to use this verse in preaching? Under what kind of situation can you make good use of this verse? Can you think how to use this verse in preaching? Yes, Maharaj. It, one, one thing is very simple that uh, uh, what demigods also comes in the, in the realm of sphere of material world. And Supreme Lord is in Supreme Abode, Supreme Sky. Uh, spiritual sky go, uh, in Vakuntas. So uh, any intelligent man with a good fund of knowledge will be able to understand that he wants to come uh, out of the cycle of birth and death. If he worship demigods, he will be in the material world only. And what to say about the ghost and ancestors? They are all in here. And But if he worships Supreme Lord Krishna, then he will uh, be promoted to uh, he will go to uh, Vaikuntha planets or uh, very fortunate will go to Golo Vrindavan. But that, that's not mentioned in this verse. Krishna doesn't say that he has, an, uh, his, uh, he has a place outside this world. He simply said, you come to me, you worship me, you live with me. He doesn't say where you live, but he said you live with me. He, so we, we couldn't just say that this verse proves that there's a spiritual world. There's no mention of Krishna having a world far beyond the material world. It just says, you, if you worship Krishna, you'll live with him. Now we may say, well, Krishna's in Vrindavan. It means you go to Vrindavan, you live in Vrindavan. But there's no mention about the spiritual world. So that's not, your, your application of the verse is not really effective. Okay. So, Maharaj, it, it can be like that uh, the person uh, to whom we think that we stay with that person, like uh, in, if, if I think about Vrindavan all the time in my heart is even Vrindavan, so I stay in Vrindavan. If somebody is thinking about the demigods like this, Maharaj, will it, it is? No, I don't think so. But usually okay. this verse is used where people will say, well, it's all one. When they talk about oneness, it doesn't matter who you worship, you, it's all one. They're all God and you all you go to be with God. And it's like yatamat tatapat, you know, the Bengali saying, they say that the many paths all lead to the one place. It, you know, it's just, it doesn't happen like that. But they say like that, they say yatamat tatapat. Many paths, many, many, um, many temples, but they say it's all one, no difference. And we say it doesn't matter. You worship the dem. They say it doesn't matter who you worship. You get, you all get the same result. So the people talk like that. We talk about oneness, and it's, there's no variety, and it's all one. It doesn't matter who you worship. You'll all get the same result. But that's not there in this, Krishna says very clearly in this verse, you worship the demigods, you go to them. It's a difference. There is a difference. It doesn't say you can worship anyone, you go at the same place. It doesn't happen logically also. You go to the train, you go down to Helra station and one train is going to Delhi and another t train is going to Mumbai. It's not all one. There are differences. And similarly, you worship different personalities. You, you go to these different places. So that's how we apply this verse. Read. She is a prostitute. That's all Krishna says. Yetanti Deva Vrata Devam. Bhagavad Gita from 9.25. 
how you non you nonsense say that everything goes to god this is nonsense you can go to shiva you can go to indra you can go there are so many planets you will go there and that is reasonable how how do you say that what whatever ticket i purchase i go to this delhi therefore they are nonsense mooda rascals they do not know what is god what is demi god what is lord shiva what is lord vishnu or brahma they do not know if a woman says oh everyone is my husband then she is a prostitute that's all evening darshan december 3 1976 hyderabad <laughs> And sometimes Prabhupada will speak quite strongly on these points, you see. He wants people to understand very clearly how foolish this kind of statement is. Whatever ticket I purchase, it all goes to Delhi? <laughs> no. Okay, so going ahead, the glories of devotional service. Maharaj, can I, sorry to interrupt, can I ask a question, Maharaj? Okay. Much often, you know, a lot of people uh, say that, you know, whatever life is, it is here and there is nothing beyond. And there is, you know, there is no way we can go forward. So can we quote this verse there as well? Well, uh, yes, you could do, yes. You can explain to people that even within the material world, there are different places, you know, there are... The de there's the pl place of the demigods, the higher planets, and then there's Pit Pitri Loka, and then there's the p planets of the Pitris and the goats also, and they have their place. Mm. So Thank you. Thank it, you so much, it's not, Thank you. It's not all one, right? So people may say, no, you know, of course some people are very foolish, they think life is only on this planet. And they, they just can't believe that there's, that there's living entities in other places. It's very difficult for them to understand that there are other places, other inhabited places within the universe. Most people think life is only on this planet. But those who read the Vedas or those who know Vedic scripture, we know about their higher realms and lower realms also. There are living entities everywhere. So, yes, and this verse helps to support that, that there are planets of the demigods, and there are ghosts as well, and these things. And Krishna also and has his abode. He's not, he's, he's a person, he has a home. He's not just some energy or some light. He's a person, he has his own home, then you can go there to his place where he lives and you can be with him. And so it's a great opportunity. All right, the glories of devotional service, text number 26, please read. Patram pushpam phalam tolam yome bhaktya prayachati tad aham bhaktya upahritam ashna me priyatat manaha. If one offers me with love and devotion a leaf, a flower, fruit or water, I will accept it. Hare Krishna. So the significant word in the verse, you can see bhakti. Bhakti is used twice in the first half and in the second half. So devotion is very much important. It's not that Lord Krishna is eager for the leaf and flower and the, flu the fruit and the water, because he has many goddesses of fortune who are all serving him. But what he does want is the devotion. That's the important item. And the Acharyas, in commenting on this verse, they talk about the importance of making offerings, when you do offer things to Krishna, that we should offer them with devotion. And they talk particularly about cleanliness and purity. If one is contaminated, for example, then we cannot make offerings to Krishna. We have to be conscious. And we're going to, we want to offer to Krishna, we, want, we should offer with love and devotion. We have to be pure. If we are contaminated, if we're not in good condition, then how we can expect Krishna to accept our offering? You know, if we have COVID, 
<laughs> you know, if we have COVID, but they put everybody in quarantine, right? They keep you away from every. So if we're con if we're contaminated, we we keep away. We, we put ourselves into isolation because we're not so we're not pure. We're contaminated, so we're not really qualified to offer to Krishna, right? It come as a shock to people. Here's the statement, Prabhupada's lecture, someone read. How can one learn to love God? There are six kinds of reciprocation, six kinds of exchanges, dadati. We have to serve God in that way. Therefore, if you want to serve Him, start with some offering, patram, pushpam. Anyone can offer a little flower, some fruit and a little water. So the Lord says, Patram Pushpam Phalam Toyam Yo Me Bhaktaya Praya Chati. The important thing is love. Lecture on BG 9.24 to 26, New York 66. All right, Prabhupada is referring to the Upadeshamrita or the nectar of instruction. He uses the word Dadati, right? Dadati Pratigrinati Guyam Makyati Prichati. Bhongte bojayate chaiva, right? Six six kinds of reciprocation. Do you know them? Have you studied the nectar of instruction? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. And there are six kinds of reciprocation, or six kinds of loving exchanges between one devotee and another. And first of all, we have. Offering gifts in charity and accepting charitable gifts, offering prasadam and accepting prasadam, and inquiring confidentially and revealing our mind in confidence. So these are the six kinds of reciprocation between one devotee and another. So we have to serve Krishna in that way also. We want to serve him. We also offer patram, pushpam, Palam toyam, right? But Prabhupada points out the important thing is not so much the offering, but it's the devotion, right? So bhakti is an important item. And we have to remember that. Sometimes we make an offering, you know, we just put the plate on the altar and we rush away back into the kitchen, you know, and you ring. Somebody's you maybe ask your husband to make the offering or ask your child to make the offering and they ring the bell and <laughs> they don't say anything. Sometimes you see people they just ring the bell, they don't say anything. They may bow down, they get up again two minutes uh, one minute later or less. They don't chant anything. We're supposed to recite prayers, we're supposed to invite Krishna to eat. Anyway, the important thing is love. And Prabhupada also explains this is the beginning. This is the beginning. He said just uh, offering some leaf, flower, fruit. Not that we have to limit ourselves to that. We can offer more. But this is a good start. Okay. Yeah, then text 27. Someone read. Yad karoshi yad ashnashi yadju hoshi dadashi Whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you offer or give away or whatever austerities you perform, do that, O son of Kunti, as an offering to me. All right, this is uh, Karmarpana, offering the results of our work to Krishna. Karmarpana, right? This is something different from the previous verse. The previous verse was speaking about bhakti. This is just offering the results of our work to Krishna. Read. Srila Vishwana Chakravati Thakur explains that the bhakti described in this verse is one step below the Kevala bhakti described in text 14, 22 and 26. Yet it is superior to Nishkam Karma Yoga because here everything is offered to Krishna, not only those actions performed in the scriptures. All right. So what is, who knows text 14? Do you remember text 14, ninth chapter? 
Nobody remember? Yes, right. Satatam Kirti Yantamam. Good. Yes. Always. Okay, good. And then text 22 is? Text 22. Right, yoga kshema baham yaham. That's a yoga kshema baham yaham verse. And then text 26 is the patram pushpam palam toyam. Right? So those three verses, they're just, those three verses are all describing the highest form of devotion, pure devotion. So they're important verses, they're pure devotion. But here, this text 27, it, it's describing something a little below pure devotion. Because, well, you go ahead and read. Oh, we have to go down, right? Yes, go ahead. One might ask, but when you One mention sacrifice... <laughs> go ahead, Maharaji. One might ask, but when you mention sacrifice, that's derived from Archan, which is an Anga of Bhakti and aims to please Vishnu. And when you mention austerities, this refers to vows such as Ekadashi Pass. This is all Ananya Bhakti, isn't it? <laughs> Keep reading. Krishna replies, only if one first surrenders to the order of Guru and Krishna and then acts, but if one does, what he likes and then offers a result to Krishna, that action is tinged with personal motivation and cannot be considered pure bhakti. Mm. Srila Baldev Vidya Bhushan explains that the Sanishtha, Kanishtha, Kanishtha devotee offers the fruit of his prescribed one ashram or duties for the satisfaction of the Lord and that is called Karma Yoga. The Parinishtha devotee also performs his burn ashram duties and offers them to Krishna. But his main focus is in the activities of bhakti, such as Shravan and Kirtana. He is the one described in the in this verse. The Kevala Bhakti of a Nirapeksha devotee was described in text 14, 22 and 26 of this chapter. <laughs> okay. Did you get all that? <laughs> so, the distinction is made between pure devotional service and karma yoga or mixed devotion. Because the devotee was arguing, well, look, I'm doing bhakti. He said, he said because it said, uh, all that you do, all that you eat, all that you offer and give away, whatever austerities you perform, do them for me. So one person may argue, he said that, look, I'm my bhakti, I'm, my, I'm, I'm doing my devotion, my worship is to please you, to please the Lord. And I'm doing my austerities, that's also to please you. My austerity, I'm doing my ecodicy, fasting and like that. So isn't that pure devotion? But Krishna says, well, only if you first surrender to the order of Guru and Krishna and then act. You see, first surrender to the Guru and Krishna, that is bhakti yoga. But if you surrender after the activity, you give the fruit of your work, then it's not bhakti, that is karma yoga. If, why? Because you're attached to that work. And so Krishna said, if you do what you like and then offer the result to Krishna, that action is tinged with personal motivation. It's, cons it's not pure bhakti. You're attached to working, you wanted to do that work. And you, but you offered the results. Okay, it's nice you offered the results, but it's not pure bhakti. It's niskam karma yoga, right? And then at the bottom here, it's a little different. That first part, that was uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. And then the, at the bottom here, we have Baladeva Vijapusan. And he's explaining about the devotee offering the fruits 
of his duties in Varnashram for the service of Krishna. So that is also called karma yoga. The results of your Varnashram, that is not bhakti yoga, that's karma yoga. A devotee performs his Varnashram duties, offers them to Krishna, but his main focus is in the activities of The devotee's main focus is in the activities of bhakti, such as shravanam and kirtan. So he is the one described in this verse. The kevala bhakti was described in 14, 22 and 26 of this chapter. All right, so parinishta. Parinishita devotee performs the duties, performs the duties in Varnashram and offers them to Krishna. But if his main focus is in the activities of bhakti, such as hearing and chanting, then it's very good. And he is the one described in this verse. So it's just a little down from 26. Oh, Karmarpana, text 27 and 28. Someone can read this story. There is a story that some sannyasi went to a householder because the sannyasi begs from householders. They are not they are not beggars, but they introduce themselves as such uh, so that the householder may receive them and take some advantage of their knowledge. So the sannyasi went to a householder and the housewife said, Oh, this beggar is going from door to door. Give him, give him some ashes. So the sannyasi reply, replied, All right, give me some ashes. Just begin your charity. So similarly, when Krishna asks, Give me a little flower, a little fruit, a little water. It does not mean that he is begging. He is just uh, inducing you to the practice of offering everything that belongs to him. So can you get the point here? That, that we don't just stop with offering, we shouldn't be satisfied just to offer a leaf, a flower, fruit, water. If we can give more, we should give more. This is just Krishna's, Krishna was just encouraging people in the beginning to get them started in devotion. Okay, go ahead, text number 28. In this way, you will be freed from bondage to work and its auspicious and inauspicious results. With your mind fixed on me in this principle of renunciation, you will be liberated and come to me. All right. So what is auspicious and inauspicious? <laughs> and sometimes people, we, you know, we, can become, we become very concerned what is auspicious, what is inauspicious. But we want to, to fix our mind on Krishna. That's the important thing. And fixing the mind on Krishna, that is called the principle of renunciation. So what is actually renunciation? Fixing our mind on Krishna. One whose mind is fixed on Krishna, he is actually renounced and he will come to me. In text 29, read. Samo aham sarva bhuteshu name desho asti na priya ye bhajanti tu maam bhaktya mai te teshu chapyaham I envy no one nor am I partial to anyone. I'm equal to all. But whoever renders service unto me in devotion is a friend is in me and I'm also a friend to him. So we can see in this verse there are two parts to it. First of all, Krishna says in the beginning, he said, I envy no one. I'm 
not, I'm not partial to anyone, I'm equal to everyone. So that's the first part. <laughs> of course, Krishna doesn't have any, anything to envy anybody for, because <laughs> he's Krishna. He's not lacking in anything. He's not lacking in renunciation, he's not lacking in wealth, he's, he has everything in full. So he's not envious of anyone, and he's not particularly partial to someone. He says, I'm equal to everyone. But then the second half of the verse, he says, he kind of turns it around a bit, he said, whoever renders service to me in devotion is a friend, is in me and I am also a friend to him. So the second half of the verse, Lord Krishna shows his special appreciation for his devotees, those who are giving him confidential service. So they are very dear to Krishna. So it appears like there is a contradiction there, because in the beginning he says he is equal, but then he said, no, somebody gives devotion to me. then. He's very dear to me. So Krishna indicates that not everybody is fully equal. The, those who are devotees are very special. They're not equal to everyone. They have a very intimate connection to Krishna. And Prabhupada explains, he said, he said, why not? He said, just like a mother, she may love all children, but she has a special love for her own child. So that is the idea, the one who is the mother, she will have the special love for her own child. In the same way, Krishna has a special love for his devotees. Alright, here's a, from Prabhupada's purport. Someone read? One more question here, that if Krishna is equal to everyone and no one is his special friend, then why does he take a special interest in the devotees who are always engaged in his transcendental service? But this is not discrim discrimination, it is neutral. Any man in this material world may be very charitably disposed, yet he has a special interest in his own children. The Lord claims that every living entity, in whatever form, in his son, and so he provides everyone with a generous supply of the necessities of life. He is, he is just like a cloud which pours rain all over, regardless of whether it falls on rock or land or water, but for his devotees he gives specific attention. Such devotees are mentioned here, they are always in Krishna consciousness and therefore they are always transcendentally situated in Krishna. Thank you, Manaji. Yes. So Prabhupada very clearly explains here the special relationship which Lord Krishna has with his devotees. Although he loves everyone, but still he has a special feeling for his devotees and he maintains them, takes care of them. All right, we have to go on to the last section of this, this chapter here. We're going to hear about some devotees who may be, be doing something which is really not proper, described here as abominable action. So, durachar, right? They're apichat to duracharo. They're, they're abominable, they've done something disgusting. So, text number 13, someone read. Even if one commits the most abominable action, if he is engaged in devotional service, he is to be considered saintly because he is properly situated in his determination. All right, so we're hearing again about determination. We must be determined, <laughs> engaged in devotional service. So, he's, he's done something, he's, or maybe he has some habit which he's not able to give up, he's, or he's done something which was really bad, but at the same time he's doing devotional service. 
So Lord Krishna says he should be considered saintly. And be, why? Because he's situated in his determination. Now, if he was not determined, if he did something disgusting, he would just give up and go away and feel ashamed. But because he's so attached, because he's so determined, he, he wants to do devotional service, he wants to serve Krishna, so he doesn't go away. And he takes uh, the criticism, he takes uh, the shame of having performed activities which were really abominable. Right? Lord Krishna. So here, here's a question for you. How could the message of statement of Lord Krishna in chapter 9 verse 30 that his devotee will never perish be misunderstood? And what is the actual meaning here? So text number 30. The devotee will never perish. Actually, it's not really in this verse. The devotee will never perish. But you know the verse, right? You all know Kunti Apriti Chanehi, Nami Bhakta Pranashati. So it's not in verse 30. What verse is that? Verse number? Kunti Apriti. Maharaj is 31. It's 31, Maharaj. 31. Okay, the next yes, verse, yes, right? Ma yeah, thank you, Maharaj. Yes, ma uh -huh. So, uh, how could that message be misunderstood? Like some may think that uh, a devotee can do anything and still uh, Lord will protect him. Like he, he can be engaged in a, a wrong activity. Like we see progress, uh, like Sahajiyas also, on the name of devotional service, they, they sometimes do uh, wrong activities also, which are not uh, approved by the scriptures. So some people might think that they are, that Lord will still protect them. Yes, right. Can you think of what kind of activities they may have done and they thought the Lord will protect them? Like taking uh, intoxication, like like taking uh, uh, like tobacco and all those uh, tobacco basically, like sometimes they take those kind of things. Also. Yes. Some intoxicants also like ganja and those things. Uh-huh. Yes. Good. Mm -hmm. Marriages. Any comments on this? So I I just want to say that it talks about uh, if uh, someone does it by accident, right? So it's not an intentional offense or a fall down. It is something which is coincident. Well, coincident, it, right? It, it, it's not necessary. That may not may be true, but may not. It, it may be that it's habitual. That he, ha he does it more than once. He does it again and again. He's not able to give it up. So, so habit is also, isn't it like accidental? Because we don't know that this is part of our life and we keep doing it again and again, even if we try not to do it. Do you think that this is... So, yeah, but it's not intentional, right? Because you're, ha you're habitual and it's not intentional. So, does Krishna protect if it's not an intentional mistake or the mistake happens. So I could think of, say, any offense against Vaishnavas, can an accidental offense against Vaishnava, or you say something against somebody. Do you think that Lord Krishna would still protect the devotee? Yes, I think so. Maharaj. Yeah. Maharaj, I, I believe that, um, not I believe, uh, Maharaj, devotional service is so potent that uh, there is no need to do any prashit in this. What we have to do, what we are already doing. If somehow or by chance, if somebody by mistake or somebody commits any offense or any mistake, so he needs not to do any prashit. The prashit in the devotional service is to be determined and uh, be confirmed and be fix our mind that uh, that we we will not do this mistake we will not commit this mistake again and uh, uh, more strictly we have to perform the uh, activities of spiritual life the reason is devotional service is so potent yes devotional service is very potent but Somehow he may he may be in his heart. 
he may not like to do the activity again, but somehow he may do it again. He just why in, in second chapter we had the question of Arjun, why do people perform activities even unwilling, as if engaged by force, or third chapter, right? As if engaged by force. So there's a force, that force, which you know, unwilling, we're unwilling, but still we do it. Maharaj, uh, as we are, we were reading that uh, uh, devotional sub. Uh, if we just follow the instruction of Guru, uh, so devotional service is for, so potent that it will uh, take away the tendency even from our heart to commit mistakes or sin. It is so potent. We just have to determine. And yes, there are three modes of material nature who forces us. But still, we have to be engaged in the devotional service. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. Yeah, we have to be engaged in devotional service. Maharaj, also, this is an offense to uh, commit sinful activities on the name, on the strength of holy name. So, yes. if we are, uh, if we are doing wrong activities and thinking that our spirituality will counteract. So actually we are committing an offense uh, against holy name and devotional service. Yes, right. You know, when Krishna says also that my devotee will never perish, then people may often misunderstand it, that uh, they think, well, I'll never get sick, I'll never get disease, I'll never die. <laughs> you know, some people they, they have that problem, you know, they, we, we actually think like that, that, you know, Krishna should protect me from getting... And they, sometimes devotees, their faith is weakened when they hear, the, oh, this, uh, a devotee died, and he died, oh, he got a disease, he got cancer and he died, or he was in a car crash and he died. And we thought, how could that happen to a devotee? Doesn't Krishna protect the devotee? Right? So. How do you understand that? Oh, you're all shocked. Like, yeah, go ahead. yeah, go ahead, Prabhu. Maharaj, like uh, problems will come uh, come in the life of devotee. Like Pandavas also had to undergo so many problems. So, it, uh, because in material world, it, their problems will be there. But, uh, but a devotee is always equipoised, like Parikshit Maharaj was also cursed that he will die within seven days. But, uh, but he knew that, that uh, like I should uh, not, instead of like criticizing or thinking that while Lord is doing it, uh, like this with me, he, he thought that this is a special mercy uh, of Lord on me and I can uh, engage my time in hearing and chanting the glories of Lord. So devotee takes everything as mercy of Lord, like Brahma, Lord Brahma also told like, uh, and not, not remembering that verse that Hridvag uh, Vapurvir Vidya Namaste Jeeveti Mukti Padesa Daivag that a devotee although he has so many problems in his life still like the Estatte Nukampa Sukhsamikshamana that he just considers everything like, like whether tribulations met, uh, problems are coming that also has mercy in his life whatever is coming in his life yes yeah, that, that, that's an advanced devotee, but not everybody's up to that, you know, that's, that's high level devotion to think like this. Yes. But some newer devotees, I, w I remember there was a newer devotee and he'd recently been initiated and then uh, like about a month or two later he was diagnosed with cancer. And so it was a great shock to him because he thought, he thought you know, that how is it possible? I'm taking initiation, and I'm, ch and I've, now I've got cancer. And he thought, he said to me, he said, "How will I ever be able to preach to my friends like when they know like this? They'll say, oh, you see, your faith didn't protect you. Your religion is no good. Didn't protect you.' <laughs> so, pe some people think like that. So I explained to him. I told him. I said. No, you have to preach to them now you say, and tell them that, you know, we're all going to die, that this planet is Mrityu Loka and everyone's dying 
but we don't know when we're going to die. But Krishna is so kind, he's informed me that I've got this disease and that my death is imminent and I have to prepare myself. So that's one act of mercy of Krishna. And I know how to prepare myself for death as well. I'm, I'm not bewildered about it and I, I know that death is simply the change of the body. I'm giving up one body, I'm going to accept another body. So there's nothing to be lamented. And so I said, it's a good time for you to preach to people and convince them about the power of this philosophy. Yeah, he, he was a little bewildered, poor fellow. But, you know, I somehow I, I encouraged him that you should preach. I said, don't think that this can't happen to anyone. It happens to everyone. Just because you're a devotee, don't think it's not going to happen to you. Yeah, we all, we all get disease, we all get old age, we all get death. But we're not bewildered by these things because we have Krishna consciousness. Is it clear, everyone? Yeah? Uh, yes, Maharaj. yes, Maharaj, but I want to ask one thing, Maharaj. Uh, yes, the answer is that uh, we will not be bewildered and the, uh, uh, whatever, and to surpass that phase, we get strength from Krishna only. Uh, Maharaj, as you asking, you were asking the question like if somebody met with an accident. So it also comes in my mind that when we honor Charita, uh, uh, Chaitamrit. So we say that Akal Mithyu Harnam Sar Vyadi Vinashanam. So Vishnu Charn Utva Pitve Punar Jinam Navidyate. So, Maharaj, how to understand if somebody honors Charitamrit and met with an accident? Well, yes, we met. <laughs> we understand it's the arrangement of Krishna. It's not karma. It's the arrangement of Krishna. Krishna wants us. He's putting us into a situation. We have to see the hand of Krishna and what's going on around us. Krishna is the supreme controller. So it's, we meet with an accident. Krishna must want us to be more careful. He wants, maybe he's giving us more time to chant by giving us an accident. Uh, he's making us more aware of the temporary nature of the material world. And he's telling us we have to get ready to leave the body because we're all going to have to leave the body one day and we have to be ready. So something goes wrong. Uh, and Maharaj, from the preaching point of view, you were saying, so if, if you can please tell from a preaching point of view, if somebody asked that uh, he was a devotee, he was doing this, we can understand because we are, we are trying, we are a sadhaka, but how to explain to uh, other person? Somebody is not a devotee? They're not a devotee, okay, then, yes, then the, the, whatever happens to them is under the law of karma, it's their karma. And no, no, if somebody asks, if non-devotee asks that he was a devotee, he met with an accident, so how to answer them, Maharaj? Oh, non the non-devotee wants to understand why a devotee met with the accident. Yes, Maharaj. Well, we have to tell him about the, the arrangement of the Supreme Lord, that behind everything there's a controller, a Supreme Controller. And Krishna is the overseer, he's the permitter of everything which happens. So whatever happens, we have to understand there's a higher reason for it. And the reason for it is, you know, just like I said, we have a temporary material body. So Krishna wants us, he's giving us warning that we have to prepare ourselves to leave this world. We have to get ready. He wants us to become more serious in our Krishna consciousness. Therefore, he's put us into this difficult condition. He's given us an accident or something. So, okay, thank you so much, Maharaj. We have to see the hand of Krishna in everything. You know, certainly, things go wrong. You, have, you, you can't blame Krishna. You, you have to understand there's a reason why it happens. 
that Krishna wants us to get more, to get ready, to become more aware of our situation and this world, that this world is not our real home. We have to get out from this world. We're trying to be comfortable in this world. We're thinking, I'm a devotee, I'm a devotee, I should have my nice home and I'll live here forever. No, you won't. You're not going to live here forever. You're going to have to get out of this world one day. You have, to, you have to understand the temporary nature of this world. We have so many things, oh, I have my family, I have my home, and uh, no, it's, they, they cannot save you. We have to understand the nature of this world. Look at Maharaj Parikshit. He was the king of the world, he was emperor. He got, had, but he got cursed. He had to, uh, immediately took advantage to go and hear Srimad Bhagavatam. Right? If you know you have seven days to live, are you going to give up everything and just sit and hear Srimad Bhagavatam? Yes, Maharaj. I hope so. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, yeah. We're not just, I hope you're not just saying that, but often, oh, why me? Why I have, oh, can we do something to save me? <laughs> and then we run to so many, make so many arrangements to try to save ourselves. We want to prolong the body in the material world. Okay, we'll go ahead. Someone read this one. The words sadhu eva he said simply are very empathetic. Empath empathetic. They are a warning to non devotees that because of an accidental fall down of a devotee, fall down, a devotee should not be derided. He should still be considered saintly, even if he has accidentally fallen down. And the word mantavya is still more emphatic. If one does not follow this rule and derides a devotee for his accidental fall down, then one is disobeying the order of the Supreme Lord. The only qualification of a devotee is to be unflinchingly and exclusively engaged in devotional service. On the other hand, one should not misunderstand that a devotee in transcendental devotional service can act in all kinds of abominable ways. This word only refers to an accident due to the strong power of a material connection. Alright, so this verse refers to an accident due to the strong power of material connections. Hmm, an accident due to strong, maybe it may be some, uh, some, maybe you eat something which you shouldn't eat, you know, and you maybe eat some meat or something, or maybe somebody offers you a cigarette, or you, maybe even you took a drink or something, you know, but maybe you used to do these things before becoming devotees. And again, you know, we haven't really given them up. We haven't given up these things. It's difficult to sometimes... Uh, and sometimes the bad habit just comes back to unknowingly you do these things. So that's a fall down, a fall down, fall down. You, you, you break the vows, you give up your vows, maybe not deliberately, but somehow you accidentally, you, you didn't keep your vows which you promised. So the prayaschit is, of course, devotional service. There's no other prayaschit in devotional service. It's simply you have to take up the devotion again. So we have to continue with our devotional service. But if we fall down, then Prabhupada explains that one time you can be forgiven. He said, second time you may still be forgiven. But if it happens again and again and again, then it, you should understand it means you're not a very strong devotee. Okay? You're not very strong in your Krishna consciousness if it's happening regularly. Right? Someone read? Devotional service is more or less 
a declaration of war against the illusionary energy as long as one is not strong enough to fight the illusionary energy there may be accidental fall downs but when one is strong enough he is no longer subjected to such fall downs as previously explained no one should take advantage of this verse and commit nonsense and think that he is still a devotee if he does not improve his character by devotional service then it is to be understood that he is not a high devotee it's from purport chapter 9 verse 30 verse 30 yeah all right so Prabhupada has he's got some standards on these things. Not that we can go on every week and commit these active, commit some, have some fall down. Sometimes, you, sometimes once or twice you can be forgiven, but not regularly. So we we have to understand what is meant here in this verse. Don't take advantage to do bad to do. sinful activities and think that we're still devoted. All right, then takes 31, someone read. Shipra pram bhakti dharmatma shashva chanti nigachati konte prati janihi name bhakta pranayshayati. He quickly becomes righteous and attains lasting peace. O son of Kunti, declare it boldly that my devotee never perishes. All right. So who's being talked about? Who quickly becomes righteous? The devotee who had the fall down, accidental fall down. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur talks about this. Can you read? How can you accept the worship of such a sinful person? How can you eat the food and drink offered by a heart contaminated with lust and anger? Very quickly he becomes righteous. The present is used and not the future to express the fact that having committed sin by remembering the Lord he becomes repentant and thus very quickly becomes righteous. Oh how unfortunate I am. There is no one as low as I bringing bad name to the devotees. repeatedly shashwat he feels completely me for nitaram disgust santim for those actions or the use of the present tense can indicate that in the future he'll develop righteousness fully but even right now it exists in a subtle form after taking medicine though the destructive effects of fever or poison remains for some time it is not considered seriously Thus, with the entrance of bhakti in his mind, the sinful actions are not taken seriously. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So, interesting example is given here at the end. Just like somebody may have a fever, and so you take some medicine, and the me- the medicine may have some some poison may be there in the medicine. It may re- may re- or the effect of the fever is a poison the effect of the fever and the poisons which are there in the body will remain for some time but because you're starting to take the medicine it's not considered seriously in the same way the sinful actions are not taken seriously with the entrance of bhakti because a person's engaging in devotional activities and so he's doing bhakti so his actions sinful actions are not taken seriously yeah and it continues the conversation continues and the traces of sin such as lust and anger should be considered insignificant like the biting of a toothless snake does he attains nigachati complete cessation of lust and anger santim permanently sasvat in nigachati ni stands for nitaram completely this means that even during the stage of having tendency to commit sin he has a pure heart if he eventually becomes righteous there would be no argument however if a devotee is sinful right up till his death what is his position the lord affectionate to his devotees then speaks loudly with a little anger o son of kunti my devotee is not destroyed at the time of death he does not fall 
but arguers with harsh tongues will not respect this. Krishna then encourages the worried, lamenting Arjuna, O Kantaya, going to the squabbling assembly with a tumultuous sound of drum, throwing your hands in the air, you should fearless declare this. Declare what? Declare that my devotee, the devotee of the Supreme Lord, though committing sin, does not perish, but rather reaches success. Arguments defeated, pride deflated, they should undoubtedly respect you as a guru. This is Sridhara Swami's explanation. But why does the Lord order Arjuna to declare this when he could do it himself? As he will say later, Mam evayas yasi satyam te prati jane priyo sime. I declare to you that you will truly come to me. You are very dear to me. BG 18.65. In the same way, why does he not now say, I declare, Kantaya, that my devotee does not perish? The reason is explained here. The Lord considered as follows, being affectionate to my devotee and not tolerating even a slight degradation of my devotee, I'll under all circumstances uphold the declaration made by my devotee. Whereas I can break my own promise and accept criticism of myself, just as in breaking my own promise in fighting with Bhishma, I fulfilled Bhishma's promise. Thus hearing a declaration from my mouth, the materialistic disputers will laugh, but they will accept Arjuna's declaration as if written on stone. Therefore, I will have Arjuna make the declaration. And thus one should not accept the statements of the falsely intelligent persons who after hearing about Ananya Bhakti, even of the greatest sinner, think that this declaration made by the pure devotee cannot apply in cases where attachment to wife and children, sinful acts, lamentation, illusion, lust, anger, and other despicable qualities manifest. Mm. So here Krishna says, Kontaya Prati Janihi. You promised, so I shall protect you promise. Protect your promise. Name Bhakta Pranaya Sati. Anyone who has taken to Krishna consciousness will never be destroyed. Name Bhakta Pranasyati. Of course, a living entity is never destroyed so far as his constitution is concerned. Na Hanyate Hanyamane. The destruction of this body. The destruction of this body is not destruction. The real destruction is that if we lose our spiritual consciousness, we can also lose our identity. In our material conception of life, we are practically destroyed because as spiritual beings, we have a blissful eternal life. We have full knowledge, but here we live in wretched conditions, feeling that life is not eternal, not blissful and not in full knowledge. So are we already destroyed? We are thinking we are advancing in civilization, but unless we revive our original life of eternity and full knowledge and bliss, we should know that we are not advancing. We are being defeated by the illusory energy. This is destruction. Destruction of real life is materialism. So here Krishna says, Kantaya Prati Janahi, Please declare in the world that anyone who has taken to this Krishna consciousness will never be destroyed. He'll never go back again to the material life of sense gratification and to this material existence full of miseries. Lecture on BG 9.27 to 32, New York, 1966. Hmm. For some reason, I'm reading the New York lectures. I think this is the third or fourth one. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Yes, Prabhupada encouraging devotees. Anybody who's come to Krishna consciousness will never be destroyed. He can never go back again to that material life of sense gratification. So, this is uh, <laughs> Krishna's words here. We may say, well, look, come on, we've seen people come to Krishna consciousness and they go out of Krishna consciousness. Well, sometimes they may go out, it means 
it can mean two things. One is maybe they were never really in Krishna consciousness. They were physically present, but they were not actually wholly surrendered. They were not really committed to Krishna consciousness. They'd simply come to Krishna consciousness and they were taking part. So physical presence, but not really committed to the practice. And other people who may go out, for, they, they come to Krishna consciousness and they were committed and they were taking part, but somehow they give up, then they go out for some time, they'll come back after some time, they will come back. Sometimes it happens that they just have to go out and, and they just have to be in the material world for some more time and eventually they'll come, after some time they, get, they again come back and take up Krishna consciousness. So then text 32 describes about even though they be of lower birth, O son of Prita, those who take shelter in me, though they be of lower birth, lower birth meaning in the Vedic culture, in the Vedic culture women, vicious merchants and sudras, workers, are all considered of lower birth. They can attain the supreme destination. So uh, we can see Krishna consciousness is for everyone. It's mentioned Papayona, the Papayonis, the sinful people, people of lower birth, they can all achieve the supreme destination, the Paramgatim. And the, the people are mentioned, Striyo Vaishyas Tata Sudras, they can all go to the Paramgatim, the Supreme Abode, even though they be sinful people, Papa Yunai, because we're born, if we're born in these lower castes, if we're born in a, a lower body, it's due to past, due to our past sins, it's not by chance, it's due to our past sins that we're put into these lower positions in the social system. But it's not a barrier to Krishna consciousness. We can still become Krishna conscious. We have to take to the process. So women are particularly mentioned here, as well as Vaishyasudra. And people may say, oh, this is not fair, prejudiced, why women like... But Krishna says also, it's also a Vedic statement that uh, Kalo Sudra Sambhavaha that in the Kali Yuga, everybody is the Sudra or Lord. And so everyone is of Lord, Lord birth in the Kali Yuga, not only women. Right? And there are many women who are great devotees. Okay, as explained here, would someone be able to read this? In India, according to the caste system or a Varnashrama Dharma, the Brahman and the Kshatriya are considered to be the highest in the society. The Vaishyas are little less than them and the Shudras are not taken into account. Similarly, women, women are classified as Shudra. The thread ceremony is, to, is given to the Brahman, Kshatriya and Vaishya, but there is no thread ceremony for women. Although a woman may be born into a Brahman family, she does not have that benefit because Kshatriya women are seen as less intelligent. They should be given protection, but they cannot be elevated. But here in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna surpasses all these formalities. He is giving opportunities to everyone regardless of birth. In the, in the, in the social structure, you may consider that a woman is less intelligent or a Shudra is less purified. But in spiritual consciousness, there is no such bar. Krishna accepts everyone. It doesn't matter whether you are a woman, a Shudra or a Vaishya. If you simply take to Krishna consciousness, the Lord is there. He will give you all protection and gradually He will help you. One who is in Krishna consciousness is already on the liberated platform. Simply, Shipparam 
it will take some time shipram but very soon he will be all uh, he will be all right so this is proposal of lord krishna and this is the facility of krishna consciousness lecture on bhagavad gita 9.29 to 32 new york 1966 thank you very much mani ji very kind very important remember these points proper just made there helping us to understand this situation yes can we have someone else read this next slide even one born into a low grade family can be elevated without exception that is shastra but there are rascals who do not allow this they have their own ideas krishna never said that only the brahmanas or indians or hindus can take shelter of me mam hi partha vepas chitya ye api suva suva whatever he may be there is no restriction just like anyone can take a bath in ganges if it is it is not that only a particular person or a particular community can take a bath anyone can and he becomes purified there is an example na hi harate jyotsna chandras chandala veshmani when there is moonlight there is no discrimination that a bhangi's house should receive the moonshine whilst a chandala's house whilst whilst at a chandala's house there should be none the moon shines upon the place of the king or on the house of a chandala na hi harate jyotsna chandras chandala veshmani krishna's mercy is for everyone and it is not restricted to a certain community or class of people anyone can take advantage of krishna consciousness conversation washington anyone krishna consciousness is for everyone right all right now we've come to the final verse of the chapter and this is considered the most confidential knowledge all right the, this is the, the chapter 9 was entitled the most confidential knowledge and this verse is actually considered the essence of this most confidential knowledge someone read manmana bhav mat bhakto madhya ji na mam namaskuro mam evashya se yukta evam atmanam mat parayanah Engage your mind always in thinking of me. Become my devotee. Offer obeisances to me and worship me. Being completely absorbed in me, surely will come to me. Hare Krishna. Mm. All right. So four activities are being described in this verse. And first of all, engage the mind in thinking of Krishna. So we heard that also at the beginning of the seventh chapter, the very first verse in the seventh chapter that. Now here or do you know how by practicing yoga and full knowledge of me you can know me in full free from doubt all right maya satta mana parta that was the first verse of the seventh chapter that we had to fix our mind on krishna and here also at the middle of the the exact middle of the bhagavad gita the end of the ninth chapter is the heart of the bhagavad gita and krishna is saying fix your mind on me become my devotee mad bhakta and then also offer obeisances namaskuru and then worship me mam evaishyasi yupaivam right like that become my devotee think of me become my devotee offer obeisances and worship and the result is surely you will come to me because you're fully absorbed sarva guya tamam sarva guya tamam so that it, remember we had confidential knowledge and we had more confidential knowledge and now we have the most confidential knowledge right you remember confidential knowledge was about the the difference between the body and the soul and then more confidential knowledge was hearing about krishna's energies and about different ways in which people worship krishna and then the most confidential part of knowledge described here the most confidential part of knowledge is that one should become a pure devotee of krishna and always think of him and act for him concentration of the mind on the form of krishna constitutes the 
most confidential part of knowledge. And this is, declared, this is disclosed to Arjuna because Arjuna is the most dear friend of Krishna's. Bhagavad Gita 1865 purport the most confidential part of knowledge to become pure devotee. All right, so a review of chapter 9 here. We began hearing about Krishna, qualifications and disqualifications, right? Remember what were the qualifications and disqualifications? Mainly? Non-end. Non there was no, quali yeah, there was no qualification required. Yeah. The, there are qualifications mentioned here. Mm -hmm. We're hearing about Krishna, there are qualifications required. We should not be envious and we should have faith. Yeah. Right? It's so th those be. kinds of things are required. That is, yeah. we, we don't say you have, to, you have to be an IIT graduate or you have to have a diploma or you have to have anything. No, but you do have to hear about Krishna with the right attitude, if you want to get the results. And then we spoke about Krishna's inconceivable relationship with the material world, right? How he's above everything. At the same time, he's, he's doing everything. It's all happening under his direction, but he's aloof from it all. And we gave the example, we heard the example tonight about the smelling power of the flower, it, it's separated from the flower. We can smell the flowers without touching them. Then we heard about non-worshippers, non-worshippers, Abhijananti Mamudha, the foolish mock at Krishna who appears amongst them like an ordinary person. And the result of that, whatever they try to do, Mogashya Moga Mogashya Moga Karmano Moga Jnana Pichetata. Right? Whatever they try to do, their attempts to cultivate knowledge or their fruit of activities or their in, in, endeavors to enjoy sense gratitude, they will never be successful. They will never be. For people who have committed that mistake of denying the personality of Krishna, or if we simply take him to be an ordinary person, it's an offense. So that was 11 and 12, and then 13 and 14 was describing the Mahatmas, who were always chanting the glories and endeavouring with determination and worshipping Krishna. And then 15 was a summary and describes the different people, how some people worship the universal form and some people are pantheists or demigod worshippers and other people are impersonalists, monists. So you've got the monists, you've got the people worshipping the impersonal form and you've got also the demigod worshippers. And then so that was there, 16 to 25, we simply put Krishna is the supreme object of worship. Others are, the other processes are worshipping Krishna, but it's all indirect worship, right? The demigod worshippers are indirect, the universal form is also a little bit indirect, and the pantheists are indirect. And then finally we heard about the glories of directly worshipping Krishna. We had, for example, uh, Yoga Kshema Bahamiyaham, how Krishna carries what we lack and he preserves what we have. And we heard also that we can offer a leaf, flower, fruit and water with love and devotion and Krishna will accept it. <laughs> Okay, and then at the end of, we heard also how even someone's a sinful person, sudaracharo bhajate mam ananyama, that someone has committed abominable activity, done something really bad, 
but he cannot give up devotional service. So Krishna accepts him. And Krishna promises him. He quickly becomes righteous and attains lasting peace. And so that Kuntiya Priti Janahi, that the devotee will quickly become restored. He made a mistake, he fell down, but he will quickly re-establish himself. And so we, we don't deride people for that kind of fall down. And sometimes it happens these things. Of course, in a big movement like ISKCON, it happens regularly, somewhere in the world. But we don't deride people. And then Krishna also said, it doesn't matter, we're of lower birth, we can also attain the supreme destination. And then Krishna spoke the most confidential knowledge for things. Okay, end quote, someone read. Everyone, Everyone should, attach. should attach. You read, Mataji, please. Everyone should attach himself to the person of the Supreme Personality of Godhead so that he can be eternally happy. The devotional service of the Supreme Lord is the only process by which all problems of all classes of men can be solved. Everyone should therefore take to Krishna Consciousness and make his life perfect. Okay, everybody agree? Take to Krishna Consciousness. All right. Yeah. Any, any questions, anybody? Uh, Maharaj, I had one question uh, related to this Bhakti Shastri course. Uh, like in every module, we have uh, to do uh, some OBA questions, like out, uh, open book assessment questions. Oh, right. Yeah, so, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, in every module, we are doing uh, two questions. So, if you can let us know which will, uh, what are those two questions for this unit? Like, are, you, are you doing two questions or one question? Maharaj, two questions. I thought they changed it to only one. Are you sure? Yes, Maharaj, like in, in last two modules also we have done two questions. Maharaj, if you want, you can reduce it to one. And I was about to say the same, Maharaj. We are happy to do one as well. Okay, number three, in my book it's about demigods, I'll read it to you, explain in your own words the proper, the proper, the, 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 the proper understanding of demigod worship with reference to appropriate verses, purports and analogies from Bhagavad Gita and then different verses are listed 3, 10 to 16, 7, 20 to 23 and 9, 20 to 25. Right? That's question number three. If 
explain in your own words the proper understanding of demigod worship. And you can do number one as well if you want two questions, then do number one. Explain in your own words the connection between chapter six and seven with reference to Krishna's, uh, Krishna's statements, maya sakta mana and, and yatatam apisadanam kasjan mam veti tadvataha. So explain in, in your own words the connection between chapter 6 and 7 with reference to those two phrases, from one from 7.1 and one from 7.3. Okay? There's yes, sir. Uh, so, so question 1 and question 3, right? just to confirm. Yes, right? Yes. right. Okay. yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Krishna. Yes. So, I'll see you, on, see you on Monday. Have a good weekend. Take you. care. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Hare Krishna. Ki Jai. Jai.